Hi, I'm Nicole, and as you have probably guessed, I have ADHD. I live and breathe all things ADHD in my personal, family, and professional life. I have a background in psychology and special education, and I've gained a lot of knowledge over the years about ADHD, what it really is, how it touches every aspect of your life and the life of your child, as well as a wealth of information and strategies for living with ADHD and parenting kids with ADHD. In this community, we share stories, we learn together, and we support each other as we navigate all things ADHD. Welcome. Hi, I'm Nicole, and I have ADHD. <laughs> uh, today, um, I'm going to tell a story about how I became t- to discover that and how that knowledge has changed my life. Um, I decided to do this as a pre-recorded video rather than a live stream so that I wouldn't get distracted by the chat <laughs> and I could tell the story in a more cohesive way. Uh, As much as I love a random tangent today, I will try my best to stay on topic. Although I can't guarantee we won't get lost in the weeds from time to time, even with a script. Um, I think it's really incredibly powerful to tell our stories. And that's one thing I hope to do more of on this channel in the future. So that we can see that while often this path has common themes and threads with each other in the community, um, Every story is as unique as the individual telling it. But finding those common threads with each other here in this community can make us all feel less alone and can help others along their path. So typically, the very best place to start is at the beginning. But for me, this story starts in the middle because that's how I experienced it. So a little background. I was a smart kid. I taught myself to read by the age three, I don't remember. (laughs) I just remember a stack of books in my bed. And I loved to learn. I did fairly well in school, not as well as I could have, but well enough. I made it through high school, AP and honors classes and the subjects I liked. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology and later a master's degree in special education. Um, Being in the schools was never my plan. I wanted to be a therapist. I wanted to specialize in eating disorders. I got into a lot of very prestigious graduate programs, which I ended up deferring and later not attending um, as education and career plans for myself changed. And um, we adapted that plan for both my husband and myself. I ended up falling into getting my teacher's license in special education And later, continuing that training with completing a MS degree, though getting through that master's thesis took took much longer than I would have liked, but ended up with a newborn in the middle of it. So that made things a little harder. And that newborn may be the beginning of my ADHD story. I say that is the middle because there's been a lot of looking back and reflection on the first 30 years of my life after diagnosis, which I'll go into a little go into in a little bit, but for now, let's start with that newborn baby boy. I came from a family of all girls, all the girls, very strong women who I'm proud to belong with. I only have one sister, but my mom was the second of seven children, five girls and two boys. And the majority of my cousins from all those aunts are girls, three girls, four girls, three girls and one boy. Our family does girls. Um, My youngest aunts are only a few years older than me um, for a variety of reasons. But (laughs) apart from one family of cousins that didn't live nearby, all of those cute little girl cousins and a couple of boys are 15 to 30 years younger than me. So I grew up in sort of an aunt-cousin hybrid with most of those girls. But anyway, I digress. When it came time for me to have kids of my own, it never crossed my mind that I would not have daughters. A boy would be fun 
I thought, but of course I knew we would have girls. Um, there was a running joke in my strong, possibly a little matriarchal family about the inability of any little boy swimmers to win the prize. And yet baby number one was a boy. I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. I knew how to do girls, but boys were a new adventure. When that baby boy came, however, I have never been more in love as many young mothers can attest. It was all a huge learning curve for me. New parent, working, but baby boys. <laughs> I went back to teaching when that baby was just six weeks old. So we had to establish very tight routines and schedules, which kept us all afloat and thriving, the baby at least. I was very tired that year. Um, but as that little piece of my heart grew older, I quit working to stay home with him because our parking lot trade-offs as he went to school, as my husband went to school in the afternoon, um, we're not going to work anymore with his new internship schedule in graduate school. Now, backing up a bit, I'd worked in some capacity since I was old enough to do so. I had regular weekly babysitting jobs starting at age 12. When I turned 16, I got a part-time job and I worked all through the rest of high school and college. I worked two to three jobs throughout my graduate program along with my husband. That transition out of the regular daily schedule of work with assigned tasks and a known metric for success and productivity was extremely hard for me. I'd always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom when my babies were little. That had always been my plan. Until they were school-aged, I would stay home, and that would be my primary job. But um, as overjoyed as I was by watching this little tiny human and watching him figure out the world, and as much as it was something I'd always dreamed of, I found myself bored to tears and feeling terrible about myself for feeling busy all day long and still getting to the end of the day and having a messy house, a kitchen full of dirty dishes, and what I felt like was nothing to show for my hard day's work. What had I accomplished? Where were my metrics? Well, that cute little boy was incredibly smart. At barely a year old, when he would find a new toy, he'd explore it and experiment with it until he'd figured out absolutely everything he could do with it. And then he never picked it up again. He started kindergarten reading on a nearly second grade level, but the toddler and preschool years were extremely challenging. Um, I didn't know if it was just... That's how boys were, full of energy, um, strong-willed. I had no experience with little boys. I didn't know what was normal and what wasn't. <laughs> I only knew all my little girl cousins. Even though I babysat some little boys, you know, it was a very small sample size. Um... Without going the details of his story for his privacy's sake, he was eventually diagnosed with ADHD. Turns out that level of energy wasn't typical <laughs> for little boys. Um, later, other diagnoses came along. Baby boy number two. That's right. Baby boy number two. <laughs> He's almost three years younger. The two of them could not be more different and yet so much the same. As he got older and progressed through school, he also began to show signs of ADHD, though his presentation was different from his brother's. At this point, the focus of my husband's psychology practice was zeroing in more and more on neurodevelopment. He'd spent a large portion of his training years in his postgraduate experience working with and studying autism, but his private practice was increasingly focusing on assessment of ADHD and autism and other learning disabilities. And we were both reading and learning a lot more about ADHD, both clinically and in all of our conversations <laughs> and as parents of kids with ADHD. Now, when that son was diagnosed, our pediatric psychiatrist looked at me and said, so, you know, if you've got two kids in a family with ADHD, it's probably about a 70% chance one of the parents have it. 
I laughed and kind of said, well, if it's one of us, it's probably me. I don't know. I did have a close family member with ADHD, but I didn't really have time to think about it very much. Baby boy number three was on the way. And it was a stressful and high-risk pregnancy. I was parenting two young children with ADHD and trying to help them navigate life and school and social activities and competitive baseball and <laughs> all the things. It was a lot. Baby boy number three. I called him my magic baby. But he only had two modes. He was either the cutest, happiest little snuggly, wonderful, squishy thing or he was screaming bloody murder like someone was tearing his arms off. There was no in-between. There was no ramp up. It was on or off. He's still like that today. <laughs> he came that way. He's also the child that didn't sleep through the night consistently until he was almost seven years old. We knew very early on that there was definitely something neurodevelopmental going on. By about age three, we knew he definitely was another little baby boy with ADHD in our house. He was too young at the time for formal diagnoses by the doctors, but um, my husband's clinical practice had become even more so focused on neurodevelopment, and his expertise in ADHD had grown to the point that we pretty much knew what was going on. At that point, we'd already started brainstorming what the perfect clinic would look like, um, what those services could look like and how we wish things were different. We're now building that practice and changing the way neurodevelopmental disorders are assessed and treated in our community. But that's a topic for a different day. When we finally sat down with that pediatric psychiatrist again, and now three out of three of our children were diagnosed with ADHD, he looked at me very directly and said, okay, so which parent is it? And at that point, I knew it was me. Discussions with my husband, all the books I had read and all the new research coming out about women in ADHD, how the differences and how it presents, um, twice exceptional kids with ADHD, um, and all of that research and knowledge that the both of us had gained um, it made it abundantly clear that the struggles I was having and the difficulties I had early in life were well explained by an ADHD diagnosis and not just the generalized anxiety that I had been diagnosed with since I was 19 or 20 years old. My executive functioning de deficits were the reason I could never keep up on laundry or dishes or consistently plan meals for my family. I wasn't a bad stay-at-home mom or terrible at adulting, I had ADHD. All those times I set something down and I could never remember where I put it, ADHD. The panic about whether or not I had driven away from the house and left the stove on or the garage door open it wasn't just anxiety, though I do still have anxiety and I'm still being treated for that. Maybe it was because of all the times I actually drove away for the, from the house with the stove still on and my garage door opening open and had called my wonderful neighbor for the third time in a week to ask her to peek out her window and see if the garage door was closed. It was ADHD. My struggles with sticking to a system and a routine. ADHD. Constantly interrupting my husband when he's talking and jumping to a seemly, seemingly unrelated topic, although I could follow the line from A to B. For him, it was more like A to Q to the number 14. But if I didn't say the thing right that minute, I would forget it. ADHD. Always being late for something. Well, for everything. No matter how hard I try, no matter how early I wake up, no matter how long I give myself to get ready to and how long I give myself to drive somewhere. ADHD timelineness. My struggles with sleep, always being a night owl and mornings being my arch nemesis. ADHD. Having to reread or rewind something because my mind wandered off. ADHD. Oversharing and talking 
so much recognizing it in the middle of a conversation and knowing I'm putting the person I'm talking to off and I'm domineering the conversation and I'm loud and I'm interrupting, but I'm still unable to stop. ADHD. The deep dives into whatever hobby or topic I've jumped into with both feet. ADHD. The shelves and shelves of random craft supplies for projects I had to do and was so excited about. But then I got interrupted or bored with the project and never finished it. ADHD. (laughs) The piles and piles that I could easily just walk past until that day that I absolutely could not stand it for one second longer because the sensory overload And the house was obviously caving in on me and I can breathe. So I'd start organizing and hyper-focused cleaning and then get 80% through the project and end up looking worse than it was when I started. ADHD. The over-researching and hyper-focus on every decision Particularly when it came to the kids, what schools, what extracurricular activities, which baseball team to pick. Books, finding the right books, the right toys, the right bedroom set up. I knew everything about those subjects. Because ADHD. Once I started putting all the pieces together, I couldn't believe I hadn't known all along that I had ADHD course it's not my fault the medical and psychological world is still just catching up on what adhd looks like for women and especially for twice exceptional women gifted with a disability and i made it through school just fine so then i started looking back at my life through this new lens and it became even more clear so now let's go back to the beginning To that smart little girl who walked into kindergarten reading and ready to take on the world. In kindergarten, I was on a behavior contract for talking too much in class. I could talk and work at the same time, and I would finish my work really quickly, so I was very chatty. (laughs) My reward for not distracting my classmates? A desk in the corner with higher-level reading and math workbooks. In second grade, I argued with my teacher one time when we were doing subtraction. My dad had taught me a little bit about negative numbers the night before when I was doing my homework. Because it was basic subtraction with borrowing and it was easy. So when I showed my dad and said, see, you can't subtract three from two, so you have to borrow. He responded with, well, actually, you can. It's negative one. I was so excited to share my new knowledge with my teacher the next day. She was not as excited to hear it. I remember so vividly when she asked, can you subtract three from two? And I said, yes, you can. My dad said, and without letting me explain, she kept telling me, no, you can't. I remember insisting and trying to explain to her that I talked to my dad and he told me about these negative numbers, but I couldn't totally remember and I couldn't really explain it. I was in second grade. I remember being so frustrated trying to get her to hear me. And I remember her grabbing two markers from her desk. Holding them in front of my face like this. My mind, as I remember right now, she was yelling in my face. Knowing that teacher later as an adult, as I in fact ended up teaching at the elementary school that I went to (laughs) at one point. I don't think that's what happened. I think she was just speaking very directly and firmly with me. But in my little mind, it is recorded as they're holding those two markers up in front of my head and saying, I have two. Show me how you can take away three. Of course, I was like seven or eight years old. I didn't know how to show her when she held up two markers. You could, in fact, take away three, although I knew I could. It crushed my little spirit. (laughs) That same year, my very best friend since before I could remember. Our moms were best friends. We lived just a few houses away. I spent, 
an entire summer with their family when my mom was on bed rest for a complication with pregnancy. <laughs> my best friend was put in a different class that year. Our elementary school had this policy when as soon as they found out you were best friends, you were never going to be in the same class again. <laughs> So first grade was the only year we were ever in the same class. But a new girl had moved into the neighborhood that year, and the two of them were in the same class. And they became very good friends. One day at recess, after trying once again to play with them, and being frustrated with my best friend not wanting to play with me anymore, I remember them holding hands and skipping around me at recess saying, we're best friends, we're best friends. I just remember being so completely confused by the situation. What did I do wrong? What do you mean you're best friends? We're best friends. We've always been best friends. One day they invited me to play with them. Well, back up. I just remember being so confused about the situation and walking home from school by myself that day, trying to figure out what I had done wrong. Well, one day they invited me to play with them. I remember feeling so excited and hopeful I was finally being included. That's the day they went inside to make chocolate pudding for us all. They ate their chocolate pudding with huge smiles as I bit into my bite of the mud they had served me. <laughs> that's my first memory of really struggling socially not reading social cues being a little too much for people not understanding what was going on or seeing the signs in front of me it certainly wouldn't be the last time I had situations kind of like that with multiple best friends I'd been inseparable with for several years throughout really until I was happened again my freshman year of college <laughs> Um, friends that would just turn on a dime and drop me in sometimes really cruel ways. I never saw it coming. Uh, I spent a lot of time in therapy when I was 19 and 20, working through those types of situations and healing my little broken heart, learning that there wasn't something wrong with me that would always lead to abandonment if I let someone in. But looking back at those situations through this new lens of ADHD, I could see how my ADHD impacted each of those relationships and how it impacted my ability, ability to see the breakdown of those friendships, the natural ebb and flow of friendships earlier before a crushing blow. Maybe when I could have seen the step back and let the relationship play its course the way friendships so often do. Instead, because I didn't see all those signs, I found myself blindsided again and again and always wondering, what did I do wrong? What is wrong with me? In school, I had good years and bad. I had teachers who saw me and who fought for me. I also had teachers who targeted me. <laughs> Um, there were many, many reports of talks too much on my elementary school report cards. I guess that's something I've just always done. <laughs> I just have a hard time stopping talking. In high school, I got decent grades, but with minimal effort, I could have had straight A's. I had some cognitive testing done in my 20s, and let's just say it was clear that I wasn't meeting my potential in high school. <laughs> my ACT score made up for it when it came time to apply for college. I took honors and AP classes, but not in the subjects I found boring. And those I struggled to get the easy A, even though I was absolutely capable of it. And I could never really get myself to care about some classes, usually history. I was a huge procrastinator. Uh, I remember in my AP calculus class in particular, my senior year, um, we had daily homework assignments that we could turn in every day and get feedback on. 
And then she would grade them at that point and put them in the grades. But your grades were not final until the day of the test. So you could keep all those homework assignments until the end of the unit to study and then take the test. And then you hand them in and whatever you have on there is your final grade. I spent 90% of the my senior year of high school with an F in math. <laughs> I got a five on the calculus BC AP test. I just wouldn't do the homework until the night before the test. And then I would do all the homework from the whole unit. And that's how I would study for the test the next day. And then I would get an A on the test and end up with an A in the class. <laughs> that's how I made it through most of school. Procrastination, cramming, and squeezing it all out at the very last minute. A deadline helps. I had an incredible English teacher my junior and senior year of high school. She just recently passed away. She changed my life, my view of myself as a student. And that helped me throughout the rest of my educational experience. I will always be eternally grateful to her. In college, I did better. Being able to choose classes I was interested in, a fresh start out of state with all new people who didn't have any past knowledge of me and judgments, and ideas. <laughs> um, new people who I wasn't too much for yet. I found my groove across the ocean. Still, the only classes I didn't get A's in were the classes I had to take and found because they were generals and I found them boring or pointless. I struggled, for example, with fitness for living because it required a daily uh, like exercise record. And I was not good at writing things down. <laughs> um, a history class that wasn't actually a history class and ended up being all these weird cultural discussions about, I don't know, there was definitely an agenda to that class and I was not a fan of it. Fortunately for me, I went to most of college in Hawaii, so being late was just part of life there. So that didn't affect me much, and I never took a class that started before 9 a.m. I was still definitely a procrastinator, but I could crank out a last-minute paper on just about any topic, thanks to that amazing high school English teacher. And I developed a good system for studying for tests, usually very late at night the night before, but my coping strategies worked for me. Were they healthy? Were they good study habits? No, but they worked for me. In my graduate program, I excelled in my classes, but I drove my professors crazy <laughs> because I was always coloring or doing some sort of puzzle book, Sudoku or word searches or crossword puzzles in class. This was um, before the days of the smartphone or I would have driven them crazy with that. Yeah, I'm old. Uh, they would try to catch me off guard with questions, thinking I wasn't paying attention and wouldn't know what was going on. I was always able to answer them. I needed that thing to do with my hands to pay attention. Usually I could expand on the answer and add to it. It annoyed them greatly, but what can you do? I still got the A's. I still got that master's degree. I was already becoming an expert in the concepts and application of behavioral psychology, which helped me in some of those special ed classes. I still tend to operate from that behavioral psych framework a lot of the time, and it has served me well. I can design a behavioral intervention for almost anything you can come up with. <laughs> I was good at school when I was interested, and I was good at work. But when my life as a mom became more complicated... My previous coping strategies of procrastination, being really good at flying by the seat of my pants at the last minute, just weren't keeping up. I could manage and keep track of my own schedule, but now I'm adding a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth schedule to the mix, and I was floundering, managing household tasks like laundry and dishes and cleaning the house, organization, Budgeting, meal planning, running a household, and later adding 
part-time work and running businesses. I was constantly in a state of extreme overwhelm and feeling really horrible about myself for not being able to do it when so many around me seemed to be able to do so. When it came to formal diagnosis, I didn't take the route I usually recommend to people of finding a neuropsychologist who specializes in neurodevelopmental disabilities and doing a comprehensive evaluation. I was married to a neuropsychologist who does those evaluations every day. So I had a little bit of a leg up when it comes to that. So I just brought it up with my GP who was managing my anxiety medications. He gave me a checklist and asked a lot of questions, but was comfortable in the end confirming the diagnosis. Getting that ADHD diagnosis was freeing. It really did change my life. It changed the way I see myself, the way I see the stories of my childhood. There are many more I'm sure will come up in future videos. But it explains so many things I had internally struggled with and has helped me to find my self-esteem again. Because you see, I'm not alone and I'm not broken. There's a reason for all the things I found so hard about being an adult and a mom. There's a reason I have and continue to have a hard time with friendships. My social circle is small but mighty. <laughs> There's a reason I get sucked into a subject and a new project that later loses some of its shininess and drops off. A reason why I have so many great ideas but struggle to execute them. A reason why I can rarely make it to the finish line and so many projects only get 85% done. A reason I'm late and lose things and forget why I entered a room and blurt out ideas and overshare and sometimes can be, well, a lot for people. But I can work with that. It was harder than I thought it would be to get this story recorded because ADHD makes it hard for me to know what details are important and which I can skip over. I'm not so great at summing up. <laughs> I'm never quite sure when to elaborate and when I've explained my point clearly and can stop. There's so many more details I could share and I will in the future. But I hope I've given enough to tell my story without getting us lost in the weeds. My insecurity about that is a little bit telling, but here we are. If you have questions, please put them in the comments and click through to the live stream because now that I can have gotten through and <laughs> won't get distracted, I'd love to chat and answer your questions. And I also hope that this story helps you to feel empowered to tell your own, to find your own. And if you have a story to share, please reach out because I would love to hear from you. Until then, remember, you are not alone. You are not broken. And you're doing better than you think you are. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. This video is not a substitute for counseling, psychotherapy, medical, or mental health care. The information and advice shared here should not be used in place of any form of diagnosis, treatment, or therapy. Information provided here does not involve diagnosis or treatment of medical or mental or psychological disorders. If you feel the need for professional support, please seek a local professional in your area. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only.